Well, good morning. It is good to worship. It is neat that God, in, in all his knowledge, kind of set things up knowing that we need to worship. Uh, we see it it's set up as we see the, the early church on the first day of the week always was a very important time. Not that that's the only time you can worship and not the only time we do or they did, but it's just really good to be together with other Christians. Uh, it just livens us. Sometimes it's people we can uh, rest and lean upon because of things within life. Uh, we can focus again so many different aspects, and it is good to, to worship. Uh, we are in week number two of a lesson series that's called, What Would Jesus Undo? And it, it's kind of looking at, uh, it's been popular, the little phrase, what would Jesus do? Uh, really starting in the 1990s, we started seeing it quite a bit. And there, there's different times today. You may see it on a bumper sticker. You may see it on an armband. It, it's a really good thought. What would Jesus do? And it, it comes from a book in 1896 that uh, Charles Sheldon did that's called In His Steps. And he takes different people's lives through that because they were encouraged by a preacher to always follow in the steps of Jesus. So in any situation, what would Jesus do? Follow in his steps. And he shows them through their lives, the stories, that when they did it, their life was always better. And I think we would see that. As we, we see, what would Jesus do is very important. Jesus gave us an example, but not just an example. Jesus also came to do things, like we think of Calvary's cross. We think of the resurrection. Yes, he came to do things, but also I believe Jesus came to undo things, like the sting of death, sin, the consequences, and many things. But I believe also within our lives, a lot of times to help us to do what Jesus wants us to do, a lot of times first we have to say, what would Jesus undo? Because sometimes there's things that have to be undone before we can do. And you see that a lot in Scripture. Uh, it is an aspect of Christian counseling. That so often in Scripture you will see the things we need to put off and the things that we are to put on. That so often there's things that need to be undone to help us to do what Jesus wants us to do. And so this morning we're going to be looking at worship. And especially hollow worship. So we're to put on worship, but we're to make sure we undo hollow worship. I want to share a little bit about myself growing up, that I, I grew up in a, a family that didn't just go to church, the church was also our family. And so from the time I was about a week old, I was in church, and, and just that was always a part of my life, that we, we were there. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, when I got old enough for youth group, we were there for, for Sunday night if we had revivals. And back then they were long revivals, or at least longer. And, and then you look at people 100 years before that would say they were short compared to what they had. Okay, And, and then uh, vacation Bible school, we were there. And back then it was two-week vacation Bible school. And, and all this, we, we were there but also apart. Just a part. The, the church family has always been a part of my family. And so being in church, a lot of things would have been very similar each and every Sunday. We would come in to the auditorium, and we would sit in a pew, okay? And then at the right time, we would have a song leader, and typically the same song leader would, would come up and, and welcome us. And they would tell us to, to turn to him number so-and-so, okay? And usually there was this little thing up on the wall that, that had the numbers that you already knew where it was. We didn't have bulletins, okay, at, at that, that time. Uh, at least the church I went to didn't. And so he would tell us, and then we would have a piano, that there was someone playing the piano, and usually we had several different people uh, from week to week. They kind of uh, took turns doing that. And so we went through the song service. And, and basically most of the motions that took place uh, while we were 
uh, we were singing is uh, mainly here, okay? There wasn't a lot of other activity that took place unless you saw a mom or a dad smacking somebody upside the head or something like that. That was usually just about it. Uh, if we weren't being taped, I'd say who said in front of us at church, but I, we can't have that go out. Uh, but uh, we always was watching that. And, and then it's the aspect of basically we responded what we were told. You stood when you were asked to stand. You sat when you are asked to stand. And, and so not a lot of things was spontaneous within that. And every church that I went and visited, if it was revivals, they did it the same way. Even church camp. Uh, when, especially when I was younger, was the same way. Uh, that's the way we did things. And so you got your, your, your songs or hymns from a, a hymn book, okay, and you, you turn to that hymn number, and, and that's what you sang. In our church, if there was four verses, you always sang the first, second, and fourth, okay? Why they, they put a third verse in, I don't know. Uh, the author probably wanted you to also know what was being uh, taught there, but it was always first, second, and fourth verses. And sometimes you stood on the last verse. But through those years, I experienced God's presence. And then when I got to high school, we got a youth minister, our first youth minister. And he told us about this thing called Christ in Youth Conference, okay, C-I-Y, okay, that's still going today. And he said, you know, I want you all to go to it. So we, we all got on our 62-passenger uh, bus, and we took off to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and we went to CIY conference. And so we went in that big auditorium, and it seemed monstrous at the, the time. We went in there, and there was all these high school kids. That was pretty neat. We had a pretty good group, but there was so many in there. And then we saw on the stage, they had a band. They had drums. They had people play guitars, keyboards. And then when we started singing, they even projected music, okay, uh, on, on the wall and that kind of stuff. And, and you, you stood up. It was pretty lively, all that took place. And for me, that was something brand new, something that I had never, never, ever seen before. And I first kind of thought, well, that's kind of weird, okay? That, 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 that's a little bit, bit weird. But then I started thinking, this is pretty neat. And through that conference, I also experienced the presence of God. The way I grew up, I experienced the presence. In this new way that was introduced to me, I experienced the presence. And so it kind of left me with two thoughts. Which way is the right way? That's a pretty good thought. Which way is the right way? Fortunately, it didn't have to be just me to determine that because Jesus talked about it, okay? Jesus helps us in so many different ways, and Jesus also helped us to understand what is the right way to worship, okay? And so hopefully by the end of this message, each one of us, as we worship, if it's together on a Sunday morning, but also as we worship through life, we will just keep doing it better. Better and better by listening. And so for many, it's listening again to the things that we know from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to look a little bit at Matthew chapter 15, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to set up the backstory just a little bit. Jesus is in the area of Gennesaret. Okay, there is the, the, the Sea of Gennesaret, which we usually call the Sea of Galilee, okay? And so Jesus is there. He's been healing some people. And then the scribes and the Pharisees come up to Jesus and they ask him something. Now, you have to understand the scribes and Pharisees that these are the big spiritual guys within the whole country. That when you were just an average person within the country, you knew that, man, you didn't hold a shadow to them. In fact, they made sure that you knew that, okay? Most of the people were called, uh, our translations usually call the people that lived in Israel sinners. It's not the best translation. It's really the people of the land. They just did not practice like 
the scribes and Pharisees. So the scribes and Pharisees always was looking down upon them. They're just the people of the land. They're just sinners. And so they always thought they had it together. And everybody would have looked at, man, if I could ever worship God, live for God at least close to the scribes and Pharisees, that would be great. And so they are com- coming to Jesus all pompous, okay? And they asked Jesus this question in Matthew 15 too. Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? Now, that's important. Did they ask, why are you breaking the laws of God? No. Why are your disciples breaking the traditions of the elders? A big difference. They won't wash their hands before they eat. Now, as I first think about that, you think of the disciples go, man, what kind of grody guys did Jesus pick to be his disciples? You know, they won't even wash their hands before they eat, okay? Fishermen, okay, surely you would wash your hands before you eat. And so you, you start thinking, that's kind of disgusting. They're not washing their hands. They didn't have Perel even, okay? They didn't have, if you don't have soap and water, at least you could Perel your hands. They, they are eating with dirty old hands, That's really not what they were asking. The question had nothing to do with personal hygiene and possibly getting some bacteria in your mouth. They were talking about ceremonial cleansing because this was some things from the elders that was put upon the people that they needed to do according to tradition. Did Jesus follow the law? God's law, yes. In fact, he fulfills it. As he said, I didn't come to to throw it away, break it down. He, He followed the law. Did Jesus always follow the traditions of the leaders? No, okay? Because sometimes the traditions of the leaders basically violated you from keeping what God commanded. And this is where things are going. They walked into a trap, okay? Because Jesus, again, is all knowing. And so, He was probably looking for this occasion for them to come up and say something about this. But to get a little bit more of the story about these ceremonial cleansings is God did command some cleansings. And part of it, especially when God gave the law, starting with the Ten Commandments, we think of Moses and the children of Israel. Because what God was doing is God was going to come and live with them. And God is trying to help them to understand that I'm not one of these little idols that you make with your hand. I am the holy almighty God and I'm coming to live with you and you're unclean because you're sinners. And so to help them to always understand the greatness and the holiness of God is they had to go through some cleansings. That sometimes you became unclean uh, and sometimes you needed to be cleanse so that you could worship, sometimes even to come back into society. As you think about people with leprosy. People with leprosy, because there was no cure, okay, they had to remove themselves from society. And so if you woke up one morning and you had leprosy before and you look at, wow, I don't have leprosy anymore. So what you did, you went to a priest. The priest would examine your body to make sure that you did not have leprosy. And then through that aspect, you're clean, you could come back into society again. You could also come back and worship God, like in the tabernacle or in the temple uh, once again. And so there were these things that God said need to take place because of being unclean and clean. But what the Pharisees did with so many of God's laws is they went crazy about it. So much so, if God gave a few laws about cleansing. That points out his holiness. It's an aspect of worship. Remember who we are. What they did is we don't want anyone to break the law, so we will put a whole bunch of more rules around it, kind of like putting a hedge or a fence and then a stone wall and everything else, so that we will protect God's laws by all these other traditions of the elders. And so what is happening when the disciples weren't eating, uh, washing their hands before they ate, was not a commandment of God. It was one of the teachings of the leaders. And so what they did is from ceremonial cleansing, they also said, okay, before you eat. 
And the way they would do things is you went through a whole ceremonial washing, you know, you make sure the water comes down and, you know, no, it's this way, right? Because you don't want it to go down your, your elbow and stuff like that. So if you were served salad, you went through the cleansing. If then you had a main course, guess what? You go through the cleansing again. Okay, uh, if you had dessert, you went through the cleansing again. And, and, and forbid it, uh, if then said, you know, I want another piece of turkey, okay? Then you had to go through the cleansing again. This is how bizarre they were getting with, with all the different things which Jesus will help them to see. You're missing the point, okay? You're so involved in rules, you're not even understanding what the cleansings were about. It's to help us to see there is a holy God, and we're not him. But we can come into his presence. But remember, we don't come in as equals, but God will allow us to come into his presence. And so, you know how it works. It's kind of like when I was a kid at school. It was one of those things, especially in elementary school. Every boy stayed away from the girls, and the, all the girls stayed away from the boys. Why? Because they had cooties. Okay? They had cooties. And so it was just one of those ways that things worked. If you accidentally on the bus touched the girl, you had cooties, okay? Or if a girl had touched the paper and, and you then touched the paper, the cooties come from the paper onto you, and the, the girls were the same way towards boys, okay? That's the way it works. And that's the way the Pharisees treated everything. You touch that dirty cup. Okay, you touch this, you touch that. And so constantly going through all this aspect, but forgetting the whole thing that God says, come to worship me, but remember, I'm a holy God. And so they got obsessed by the rules that it basically made it where nobody could keep their rules. And so then they looked at everybody as sinners. Okay, because we can't keep all the traditions. But... The Pharisees can. And so they asked Jesus, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? Remember, traditions of the elders, not the law of God. And so Jesus asked them a question. Then why do you break the commandments of God? Okay, you can see Jesus was ready for this, okay? So they're talking about traditions that don't amount to anything except in their society. And Jesus says, why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your traditions? Okay, so Jesus is getting to it. For God said, honor your father and mother. Is that law? Part of the Ten Commandments, right? Okay, this commandment of God. So Jesus is saying, for God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and mother with it. So remember that, devoted to God. We'll come back to that. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he said he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely Human rules, okay? You can see why they started getting mad at Jesus. These are these pompous guys that, that rule everything. And Jesus now is putting them in their place. Hopefully so that they will repent. Some do. Some don't. And Jesus goes to the cross. But he was planning to go to the cross anyway, right? Okay? And so Jesus addressed just one of their rules. Okay? He's not jumping into all of them. So one of your rules basically nullifies the law of God, which is to honor your father and mother. So here's how it worked. That the kids, as the parents got older, and, you know, dad couldn't go out and make that living for each and every day, the children were to take care of their parents. Okay? That's what was to happen. That was according to God's commandments. But the scribes and Pharisees, they were kind of the wealthy ones. And they decided, I really don't want to sell my possessions, use my savings account to take care of mom and dad. 
So here's what we will do. We will take all the stuff we have and we will even make a contract. It's devoted to God. Okay? It belongs to God. Everything we have, but we'll just use it. And so when it came to caring for their aged parents, we don't have any money to take care of them. Because everything that we have around us is devoted to God. That's God, so we can't use it for our parents. So you see what's happening? Okay? They're, they're using not loopholes. They are making loopholes within their own mind that God never even made a loophole. He just said, honor your, your father and mother. Okay? And so every aspect you think on how that honor is to be done. And so Jesus is helping them see that you are breaking the law of God because you made a rule. Okay? And so you're following your rule and you've thrown out what God said, what God intended. Okay? Because we always have to look at not just the law, what is the intent uh, of the law? And so Jesus says, you think you're religious. The things that you do, everything is about honoring God. Jesus would kind of say, if we can paraphrase it, that's junk. That's not worship. That's not devotion to God. That's a waste of time. Because clearly, you're doing and going through motions of what you think to satisfy yourself. Nobody else is fooled by it. You think starving mom and dad was satisfied by it? Probably not. And so you're honoring me with your lips. It's devoted to God. But your heart's are far from me. That's not worship I desire. That's hollow. That's hollow. In worshiping God, we're going back to where I started with different types of worship. The worship that I grew up in and then the worship that I experienced later. I think from what Jesus teaches, it doesn't matter how we move our bodies when we worship. Or how much money we give. How many times we say amen or hallelujah. It doesn't matter how loud we sing or how many times we kneel or how many times we pray. I'm not saying those cannot be done. But it doesn't matter because those can just be external things. What matters is the heart. And if the heart is right, all those things are pretty important, right? Right? If the heart is right with God, if not, it is just hollow worship. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were confusing real worship with their whole aspect of what they said worship was about. No wonder the people they taught never could get it together. So what is the right way to worship? Worship with a piano, hymn books, like I grew up with. Worship with a band like I saw at Christ in youth. Which one is right? The answer is none. And the answer is both. Right? If you're doing it wrong, none of them are right. But if you're doing it right, all of them are right. Because as we have to think about it, do we worship like they did in Jesus' day? If it's from the heart, yes. Yes. The heart, but not the emotions that we do, right? And that's why it can vary so much if you go to different countries, different places. And that's why the standard always is, is it from the heart? So how do we judge the heart? How do we know if our heart's doing right? Because see, worship has nothing to do with style or the condition of a building or the clothes that we wear, or the smile on our face, or the number of people in chairs or pews, or if they're standing. It's not about lyrics. It's not about hymns. Worship only has to do with God. Right? But all of those things can help us to do things for God. Right? They're just external things. They're just furniture, a lot of it. Right? It's just furniture. You know, when I eat a meal, I really don't, not that concerned about what table I'm eating on, okay? It's the meal, okay? There's a story that's been floating around on the internet for quite some time about Francis Chan. And it's about a churchgoer saying, I really didn't like worship today. 
And the response is from Francis Chan that says, good, we weren't worshiping you anyway. Okay, I'm not sure if that's true. If he didn't say it, he would say it, okay? If, he didn't, if we haven't said it, we probably should say it. Because we're worshiping God. It's all for him. And what does Jesus desire in worship? He wants our hearts. That's what he wants. And then it can look a lot different. Even in the same place, it can look a lot different among people that are sitting by each other. Right? Right? Because a lot of things are expression. Oh, some of the words that we have for worship in Scripture are expressions. One of the main words for worship that we have is pros, you know, which means to lay prostrate before God. Okay? We wouldn't say that's very dignified, to lay flat on your face, you know, in worship. But that's one of the main words. See, God's not against posture. Sometimes posture, because of our heart, can show a lot of different things. So imagine with me, my grandkids are real young. Mine are kind of getting beyond this point now, maybe except for one, because our youngest is an entertainer anyway. So that's my grandchildren are all at our house and they've been playing out in the yard. It's a, a, a hot day. And they're out there playing in the yard and they come running in all sweaty and nasty. And you can just imagine how sweaty my grandkids would be, right? Okay. Uh, sweaty, nasty. They're all dirty. Their socks don't match. And even though that's in style now, but you know, uh, and they came in and they said, grandpa, we wrote a song for you that we want to sing for you. And they start singing it. They don't have any instruments. And they're just singing this song about how much they love me, how much they honor me, how much they care for me. And imagine me stopping them halfway and saying, kids, I appreciate the sentiment, but my preference is I like this certain style of music. And if you would add an organ, okay, it would be so much better. Uh, once you're done with that, come back and share it with me. Once you rewrite it with the proper accompaniment and everyone's singing on tune. Would any grandpa ever say that? Okay. If you would, shame on you. Okay. No. If my grandchildren wrote a song for me from their hearts and sang it, I would pick them up. I would give them a hug and I would squeeze them to the extent they'd probably say, Grandpa, you're squeezing too hard. And I would probably squeeze them a little harder and a little longer. Okay. Is the, the way it would be because they're giving honor. It wouldn't matter if they had instruments, if they were singing on, on, on key, if they were all together, if they even all said the same words together, because it wouldn't be about my preference. It would be about my grandchildren honoring me and showing their affection. And that's where the Pharisees missed it. They got into all these externals, how basically we can do what we please and their externals, the problem with their externals is it did not have the right internal motivation. See, we always have to have the right internal motivation to make the externals make a difference. That's why I could be in a particular church growing up and very much worship God. Or I could be at other situations where it is different and really honor God because it's about internals. And so that's what Jesus is trying to get across. See, God desires our hearts. He wants our love. He wants us to give honor. So what worship is right? When we sing, are we singing to God? Are we singing to be thankful for what God has done, who he is, thankful because of his forgiveness? Then that's the right internals. If we give, are we giving to God? Are we saying, I put my future in your hands? Okay? It's not about this stuff. And I will show you. I will put it in the offering plate. I trust you. When we pray, are we talking to God? If our goal, if our goal is just about motions, then we're probably missing it. But if I sing a song, if I give a few bucks, if I bow my head in prayer, if I try to stay awake during the sermon, then I'm good. 
I worshiped. Jesus doesn't want just motions. He wants our heart. So our goal is to be all in when we worship. Whatever that may look like. Your all in may look different than my all in. Okay? Our, our goal is to be present and engaged when, when we worship God. Our goal is to acknowledge that God is present in this room right now. Our goal in worship is to declare God's worth and value. Our goal is to show honor and love because of who God is. And it's not just in our worship gatherings. It's also through our lives, right? Because our worship doesn't start here and stop here within a building. No, this is a special place. So special that we see in scripture, we are encouraged to come together. But it's also in our lives, the way we love people. That's worship. The way we invite other people to know the Lord Jesus Christ. To do the things that he desires. Because it's not just what would Jesus want to undo, but also it is what Jesus would want to do, what he would do. He desires our hearts and our whole heart. Here's a confession. It was a few years ago. I was at a church for a worship service. It was one evening. It was hot. They didn't have air conditioning. And for some of you all that might be younger, you don't understand what it used to be like to be in a, in a building without air conditioning. Uh, because you would sit on the old pews that uh, usually were shellacked. And you would sit down as a boy with a white shirt and you'd sweat up against it, and then when you, you had to peel yourself off, and sometimes you had the shellac on back of your white shirt as well, okay? Especially a sweaty guy like me, okay? And so we, we were there to, to worship. It was hot. It was a, a, a little cracker box of a building in a little river town uh, that was known for not being a very good place. The church was known for being a good place, but the town was terrible. Even the EMTs hated to take an ambulance there, especially when there were certain families that had something, because usually it was one stabbed the other, but when you came to help out, then they all turned on you, okay? That was kind of the reputation of this little river town. And so we were there. It was also one of those places that uh, still did not have running water within the building, and so that meant you had a little... Uh, shack behind, okay, uh, to use the facilities. And so we, we got ready to start singing the songs. And then, that's the part I go, I'm going to like this. And so the, the preacher and his wife, he was the one going to be the song leader. She was playing the piano. And he was nothing against being old, okay, okay. I, I, I'm trying to do a confession. He was old, 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 okay. And, and he got up to, to lead and she started playing the piano, one that... Uh, made sounds more like you were slapping it instead of playing it. It was so out of tune, okay? It, it was pretty rough. And then we, we started singing, and it was so slow you could actually talk in between words you were singing, okay? Okay? And so you're, you're there with me. I would go in greater detail, but you would think less of me, okay, if I did. So I won't describe more. And as I was there singing and thinking in between words, okay, I started thinking, this worship service is terrible. But through that, God helped me to worship. Oh, it wasn't that night. It's, it took me thinking about how terrible that was for a long time before finally the Lord spoke to me, or at least I listened to, to, to think about it. That God said, you don't need a certain beat to worship me. You don't need air conditioning to, to worship me. You don't need all the bells and whistles to worship me. Worship is about honoring me, honoring God. It's declaring his worth and his value. It's not about my preferences. Oh, that preacher had a great reputation. He had preached for years and years and was doing a great work in that little town. But it wasn't about preferences. And so from that, the Holy Spirit, which is neat that the Holy Spirit is inside of us, that can keep nudging us, elbowing us, uh, 
to help me to think, well, of course it wasn't any good because that night you did not worship. Because I was so concerned about the preferences and what I liked that I really didn't worship God. Yeah, it was hot. And yes, the lyrics didn't, did not show up on the wall. And the piano was about as out of tune as you could have something and still call it a piano. But was my heart in tune? That's what matters. When I heard about God's character in the song, was I grateful to God? No, it was hot in there. I was sticking to the pew. Did I listen to God's word during the sermon to speak to me and transform me? Was my heart open to what God wanted to say? Did I take his words seriously and consider how my life may be different? It took me a long time, but I did. I remembered the service, and eventually God spoke through it. Did I sing about the truths, about how blessed we are because of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I know sometimes we, it's, people can get the wrong idea, just like when you look up here. And you see the worship team or you see my, myself up here. And it's the idea that somehow uh, we are the band and you're the audience. I hope everybody here understands that's not what we are after. It's the idea that really we are kind of like the choir director and all of us are the choir. And we have the audience of one, which is God. Because that's what it's all about. Oh, yeah, a lot of times we need a director, okay? But even the director isn't just directing. The, the best way for a worship team to lead is to be worshiping as well, right? That's right. And so a lot of times you spend a lot of time before you ever come here to get ready so that I can worship so that then in turn we all get to worship and we can bring that worship to God. God doesn't care how good a singer we are. He cares about your heart. It doesn't matter how we express ourselves, but the idea is, did you worship God while we're here? But also, are we worshiping God within our community, within our home, within our job? That's what God wants, because he wants our hearts. Sometimes when we come together, is to tune our hearts as we worship so that we can go out and live that out in everything within our lives. See, Jesus doesn't just want us to honor him with our lips. He wants our hearts to be very near. But he does want us to honor him with our lips too, right? But not just with. The reality is, whenever I come to worship on Sunday morning, here's confession. Sometimes I go through the motions. Sometimes I'm concerned about other things. Sometimes I might be annoyed about something else. But the neat thing I see over and over again, even when I come in and just doing the motions, somehow the Holy Spirit, it might be through a prayer, it might be through a person, it might be through a song, it might be through communion time that the Holy Spirit elbows me and reminds me of the grace of God, that I, a sinner, can come clean into the presence of God. Not because of all these things out here, but because of what God has said, I can come into the presence of a holy God that's more holy than you and I will ever imagine until we get into his presence. And we can worship him. And even when I come in and I go through the motions for a while, I don't leave the same way. Because the Holy Spirit keeps, hey, Norm, hey, Norm. Yeah, it's hot. And other people say, no, it's cold, okay? Oh, that song didn't speak to me. But that song may have spoke to everybody else. I may think, man, this is the worst sermon I've ever preached. And you may be thinking, yes, it probably was. No. <laughs> but the thing to ask us, how has your worship been? See, that's the real question. How has your worship been? 
how has it been today? And so as our, our worship team comes up as our choir directors, okay, the good news is our time of worship here this morning is not over, right? That we have one more song to sing, and even when we're done with that, you don't have to leave, right? You can stay here by yourself or with somebody else and continue to worship. But the neat thing is we have all next week to worship God, right? Uh, also, we can come back next Sunday and we can worship God. And he can turn our hearts wherever it is right now from where it is to being right. Isn't that cool? So let's not worship just with our lips, but let's draw our hearts near to him. Let's stand together.